-hmm. Why would you not go to the author and say, someone's trying to publish your story and without your permission? I mean, that is that is a fair question. And um, and, and probably maybe it was the right thing to do. And my, my honest answer, I'm just giving you my honest answer. My honest answer is that I think you are abusive and a bully, Tom, and I'm literally afraid of you. And I don't want hmm. really okay. anything to do with you. I'm, I mean, I'm do having this meeting because I believe it's the right thing to do and because I trust Dr. Aiken and I trust Rachel, but I really, really don't want anything to do with you because I'm afraid of you. Okay. Well, there you go. It's 2022. The Southern Baptist Convention was about to have another round of elections for the SBC presidency. Political lines were drawn, and many were looking with great eagerness at the potential candidates. One of the presidential candidates that was nominated was Willie Rice. Willie Rice is the senior pastor of Calvary Church in Florida. He has pastored the church for over 27 years. It was during this heated political climate, Pastor Tom saw a video of Willie Rice introducing one of his deacons at his church. Tom knew personally who this deacon was when he served as a pastor in Florida many years ago because he had personally counseled this deacon when he had committed a predatorial act in December of 2005. As a mentor and friend, Tom led the man, a teacher, to report to his school that he was engaged in a sexual relationship with one of his students. Tom went with him to make this report. This man was a professing and devout Christian and his willingness to go with Tom to the school to confess his sins appeared to be the fruit of repentance. In addition, he agreed with Tom's counsel that he should be forthright about what had happened with any church he attended or joined from that day forward. But now this person holds the office of a deacon, and this greatly concerned Tom because this is in direct conflict with the SBC resolution of 2021, which disqualified any person that committed sexual abuse from holding a position of leadership in the church. This prompted Tom to seek special counsel from Rachel Denhollinger, who was serving as an advisor for the SBC regarding its policies and practices for responding to issues of sexual abuse. Tom approached Rachel because he wanted to know how to handle this situation that would not be seen as political, but principled. And from the conversation, he believed that he had a biblical responsibility to go privately to Willie with this information. So thus, on March 25th, 2022, Tom texted Willie Rice. Willie, I am not sure if you saw my previous message, but it is of great importance that you and I speak as soon as possible. It involves one of your deacons who would be classified as a sexual predator to which Willie Rice agreed to connect the next day, but was unsure of the situation he was talking about, which prompted a greater concern and need for Pastor Tom to inform Willie about the deacon. On March 26, 2022, Tom and two of his elders met with Pastor Willie and one of his staff on a video call to discuss the situation. The conversation was long but Willie Rice patiently listened to Pastor Tom's advice and would eventually agree with Tom and remove the deacon from his position. The overall call, while difficult, was very cordial. In fact, Willie Rice would later recall a year later in a blog on January 31st, 2023 on how Pastor Tom approached him with this information. Tom came to me in private. He did not ambush me. He did not threaten me. He did not attempt to blackmail me. Willie was incredibly thankful for how Tom handled the situation. In fact, Willie over the course of time would be able to reconcile with Tom Buck after the whole debacle that occurred at Southeastern. He further reflects in the same blog, I believe we now have the kind of relationship where we would speak privately, listen carefully, and dialogue respectfully. Tom Buck and I have no ought in our hearts toward one another. And this feeling was also reflected after Tom met Willie in the 2022 meeting. Willie Rice stated in an email later that day on March 26, 2022, You're right. These are hard conversations, but you did a stand-up thing by coming directly to us to address this. I respect that. 
Thank you again for the conversation. But Willie Rice was a presidential candidate for the SBC, and he needed to seek special counsel on his next course of action. After the call's conclusion with Tom and his elders, Willie informed them that he would seek advice from his church leaders, as well as some people in the SBC convention. Um, I will take it. I'm going to talk to my leaders about it. I'll talk to some people that, that I value in convention leadership about it and figure out what to do from there. In other words, he was going to contact his friends in the politics of SBC to help him navigate the unstable political waters. It is a fact that Willie contacted SBC leaders he trusted immediately after that phone call. And Willie Rice informed Tom Buck later in 2023 that the only people he contacted immediately after the meeting were Josh Wester and Keith Whitfield. Yes, I talked to Willie on Saturday the 26th, I didn't talk to him about you at all, except the fact that he did fill in the gaps of the conversation you guys had. And the conversation we had was this, Willie, what's the right thing to do by this family and what's the right thing to do by your church? And that's the conversation we had. Keith Whitfield is one of Willie Rice's friends who encouraged him to run for the SBC presidency. And Keith Whitfield is also dangerously involved with SBC politics, so much so that even Danny Aiken notes this in a recorded phone conversation on May 2nd, 2022. Because I've had a conversation with Keith and I've said, listen to me, your activity in SBC politics is not helping the school and you need to cut it out and you need to cut it out right now and what keith did next was very odd according to willie rice after his phone conversation with keith keith then personally contacted the deacon and his wife why is keith the provost for southeastern personally inserting himself in this situation this is one of the many questionable actions keith will do throughout the story but only josh wester and keith whitfield in sbc leadership knew about the meeting with Willie Rice and Tom Buck. And this was the ignition to set off the wildfire. On March 27th, less than 32 hours after the meeting, David Bumgardner, an editor of Baptist News Global, received an anonymous email which contained Jennifer Buck's article. Below is an article that was written and circulated by Jennifer Buck. It seems Miss Buck was intending to deliver a rebuke to cancel culture, or Me Too, or something, but actually exposed her husband as an abuser. This is a man who abused his wife. He may have thoroughly repented, but reading this paints his commentary on abuse in the church in a very different light. An SBC friend suggested I send this to you along with these thoughts. I'm sending this anonymously because I know Pastor Buck and I've seen up close the way he will bully, attack, and intimidate people he sees as enemies. The short timing between Jennifer's article sent to BNG and the meeting with Willie Rice and Tom Buck is not a coincidence. Someone wanted Willie Rice to continue in the SBC race and saw Tom Buck as a political threat. But there was one problem. David Bungardner couldn't verify whether the draft was authentic. You know, and I just, I, it was completely unsolicited. It just showed up. And then so I read it. I didn't know whether or not it was authentic or not. And the reason why was because the Bucks' names were not in the article. It is a fact that B&G said that they couldn't verify the ref draft to know it was actually written by Jennifer. This is because the ref draft Jennifer had written did not have my or Jennifer's name in it or on it. In God's amazing providence, when Jennifer originally wrote the article, she did not include her or her husband's name, so BNG could not verify its authenticity and needed someone to confirm that the draft was authentic. Otherwise, the draft would have been easily published and we would have never have the information we know now. But someone needed to verify Jennifer's rough draft and somehow they knew the only person that could verify the document was Karen Pryor and the only person they contacted to do the job was Keith Whitfield. 
On March 30th, according to Danny Aiken, an anonymous source contacted Keith Whitfield and asked if he could contact Karen to authenticate the rough draft. Right, let, me, let me read you the best of my memory of what I think the text said from the best of my memory. It said, would you ask Karen if she would review an article supposedly written by Jennifer Buck about her marriage to confirm the authorship. I think she may know something about it. And according to Karen's account, this anonymous source was a publisher. Keith said that it was somebody had the draft and they wanted me to verify it. And it was a publication, a news outlet or publication or something. And would I verify it? After receiving the anonymous text message, Keith then calls Karen to authenticate the rough draft. What transpired in the phone conversation is unknown, but whatever it was, it prompted Karen the next day, March 31st, to reach out to Rachel Denhollinger. And according to a text message that was sent to Tom Buck by Rachel on April 1st, Karen was seeking advice on what to do with the matter. She reached out to me because someone contacted her third hand, asking her to verify that she gotten that draft from you. She had no idea about anything with Willie and thought it was odd that it came back up. I confirmed that it was absolutely wrong to publish that and that I suspected wrong motivations. After receiving counsel from Rachel, Keith claims he suddenly remembers to call back Karen. I didn't think about it much all day on, on the next day, on Thursday. I was at my son's play at the high school that night and remembered that I told Karen I was gonna call her back. Keith then calls back Karen, to which Karen Pryor refuses to authenticate the rough draft. What I what I was asked was if I would verify the draft that I had received. Like, is, is, this, is this draft the same as that, is this draft that whoever has that I did not see the same as the draft that I got? And I said, no, I'm not doing that. I called her back during the intermission. She said, she gave me two reasons. She gave me a general reason and a specific reason. And I said, Karen, I think you're right. That makes sense to me. Keith then claims that he went back to the anonymous source and refused to provide any more information on the draft. I texted back, no, it's not right to publish a essay without the author permission. I didn't give the specific reason. The specific reason Karen gave was because you don't tell a survivor's story. But what becomes questionable is afterwards, Keith deletes the text message and the phone number because according to Danny Aiken, Keith claims he doesn't want any additional involvement with what's going on. They knew his cell phone number. And so I said, well, I want to see this, the text message and the phone number. He said, I deleted it. And I said, why did you do that? And he said, well, because I didn't want to have anything to do with this. Why did Keith delete the anonymous text message in the first place? It's already odd that Keith is willing to respond to anonymous text messages, especially when we're dealing with sensitive documents from an abuse survivor. Even though he claims it's morally wrong to authenticate the draft, he still went to Karen to authenticate the draft. And if Keith did nothing wrong in the exchange with the so-called anonymous person, then he should have kept the receipts of the exchange. But now we have to base it on his good word alone. But him deleting the message is suspicious at best. And his further actions later in the story will prove just that. Danny Aiken claims they had tried to recover the deleted text message. I have I've tried and I've been told that it can't happen, but I will and I'll ask him if he would uh, take step to see if that number and message can it all be recovered. But if the timeline of events is correct, it was possible to have easily obtain the phone number because according to Danny Aiken, Keith's service provider is Verizon and the information can be downloaded. I've asked him per your request earlier and even again to go back and see if there's any possible way to retrieve it. He even contacted Verizon but they, he says there's no phone number on my uh, log that, I, that that would match up with that. Of course, they don't keep messages, I don't think. But yeah, they do. No That's why I sent you that. They do. You can log into my Verizon account and download the list of phone numbers that texted you in the past 90 days. Beyond 90 days, you will need to contact the service provider directly. But as of this recording, Southeastern has failed to look further into the matter and easily provide the anonymous phone number. And another thing, how could Karen and Keith have known it was a publisher from an anonymous text message? And it was a publication, a 
news outlet or publication or something, and would I verify it? How did they obtain that information from an alleged anonymous text message? We don't know. But assuming that's true, in what circumstance would a reporter approach someone anonymously? After consulting with some professional media reporters, which will remain unnamed by request, all the reporters that were consulted agreed that it is unprofessional, unethical, and unusual for a reporter to not introduce themselves by name and media outlet, which raises even more questions of Keith's actions. Why wasn't he suspicious of the anonymous text message? Why didn't he ask basic questions on who he was conversing with? Why bothering responding at all? And it was already odd, Keith and Karen took 24 hours just to figure out it was morally wrong to authenticate an abuse survivor's story and to say no to an alleged anonymous text message. And finally, why didn't Keith or Karen report to Tom and Jennifer Buck that their draft was stolen? These are sensitive documents from an abuse survivor, especially Karen Pryor, who had the original draft. When Karen was asked directly why she didn't inform Jennifer that the draft was stolen, she gave a very straightforward response. Mm -hmm. Why would you not go to the author and say, someone's trying to publish your story and without your permission? I mean, that is that is a fair question. And um, and, and probably maybe it was the right thing to do. And my, my honest answer, I'm just giving you my honest answer. My honest answer is that I think you are abusive and a bully, Tom, and I'm literally afraid of you. And I don't want Hmm. really okay. anything to do with you. I'm, I mean, I'm do, having this meeting because I believe it's the right thing to do and because I trust Dr. Aiken and I trust Rachel, but I really, really don't want anything hmm. to do with you because I'm afraid of you. Okay. Well, there you go. Karen Pryor still had resentment against Tom for what he did and refused to inform Tom or Jennifer Buck the fire that was brewing at Southeastern. Within the next day, April 1st, 2022, the draft began to circulate in the dark forces of the SBC, and the Bucks were unprepared for the inferno that was ignited. I was outside getting ready for a garage sale the next day. Tom came out, asked me if I remembered writing an article about the early years of our marriage, the point of it highlighting its difficulties. That didn't bring anything to recall, as I hadn't written anything with that focus before, and asked me to read an article that had been forwarded to him to see if it was familiar. The first few lines, I didn't catch it, but as we continued to read, we realized that it was a rough draft that I had written four years earlier about the struggles in our marriage and its restoration, and it was one that I had sent to Karen Pryor to give me feedback on how to communicate my thoughts more clearly. The entire point of the article that I had written was to give God glory for His work. It was to encourage others, and it was to give people hope that God could do it for their marriage too. And whoever was doing this was ignoring that. They were weaponizing my words to use against Tom. Tom began to explain what it was they were going to do. The story had been leaked. Somebody was going to drop the story as a hit piece against him. I began to feel like I was hearing through a tunnel as these things were beginning to make sense in my mind as to what was really happening. I was, I just fell apart. I started to cry. I felt exposed. I felt manipulated and my own story, my life story was being stripped from me. It was like I was completely locked out of what the truth was. I was absolutely devastated. Thank you.